this is going to be another question and answer video and this is going to be about some very interesting questions about the millennium i find that a good portion of the questions is about the millennium and i think that's because you don't hear much preaching on it you don't hear much teaching on it it's it's unknown to most people most christians don't even know what the millennial kingdom is let alone be able to ask the questions that I've been getting. So these are very deep questions. A lot of it I'm not 100% sure on. I know what I think is right. I know that I've heard theories. I've heard different ways people believe on these questions. But I'm just going to, by the best of my ability, give you what I know about it. And maybe it'll help some people out. Uh, this is a video of probably about five or six questions from like five different people so i'm hoping that i'm gonna answer everybody's questions all at once but the first thing that you got to remember is the different classes of people that are in the millennium and in first corinthians ten thirty two, it says give none offense neither to the jews nor to the gentiles nor to the church of god so in the millennium, you're going to have different groups or classes of people. You have to remember that. You see, today, uh, the only class of saints there are is the church. You know, if you're not saved, if you're not part of the church, the body of Christ, if you've not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're lost. But number one, you're going to have born-again believers from the church age the body of Christ on earth during the millennium. In the age we are in today, if you're saved, then you are a member of the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is leaving in the rapture, which could happen any moment. The saints in the tribulation are not part of the body of Christ. If you make saints in the tribulation a part of the body of Christ, then it defeats the purpose of a rapture entirely because you would still have part of the body going through the wrath of God. It also contradicts Revelation 7, which shows us two different groups of saints that obviously aren't part of the body of Christ. The saints from the tribulation, whether they be Jewish or Gentile, will be in the millennium, along with born-again believers who make up the church. Then you will also have people from other nations who will go into the millennium. You're going to have men who aren't saints, but they had a little common sense and didn't take the mark of the beast, and somehow they survived the tribulation, and the Lord doesn't kill them at the second coming. They, along with the saints from the tribulation, will go into the kingdom in flesh and blood bodies, and they aren't going to have glorified bodies like me and you and the rest of the church. This shows us that since they don't have glorified bodies, they will still be subject to sin and death. And verses like Isaiah 65, 20 show us that people still die in the millennium. Because it says in Isaiah 65, 20, there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. So you're going to have people living a very long time. And if they died 100 years old, it's going to be like a child dying. But me and you won't have anything to worry when it comes to death. We will be in glorified bodies that cannot die. And there are Old Testament characters that represent this pattern that I'm telling you about. And I always like to look for a pattern. For example, you know the one of the more famous ones, Enoch never died. That represents the born-again believer who is alive at the rapture because he never sees physical death Enoch never saw physical death. He never will see physical death. He was not, for God took him. God caught him up. He translated him. And now Enoch never dies. If the rapture happened right now, if you're saved, God's going to call you up and you'll never see physical death. And then you have Elijah, who still hasn't ever died yet. He was taken up into heaven without dying, just like Enoch. But the difference is that Elijah comes back down as one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, and he dies there in Revelation 11. So he would represent the saint who survives the tribulation, gets called up to the Lord at the end of the tribulation, only to later die in the millennium 
because he has a flesh and blood body. So that's what he would represent. He would represent a tribulation saint who gets caught up to the Lord at the end of the tribulation only to later die in the millennium because he has a flesh and blood body. And then you have Moses. He died in the Old Testament. But he comes back in the tribulation as one of the two witnesses. And he dies again in Revelation chapter 11. This pictures the tribulation saint who dies in the tribulation, but gets resurrected to go into the millennium, and then dies again because there wasn't a glorified body. So that's what he would represent. So we've got a pattern of... You know, the different classes of people in the millennium being Moses and Elijah. So you're going to have people in flesh and blood bodies who produce children even. And those children will end up dying in the millennium. And there's children, they're going to be subject to death. And even if you don't agree with a lot of what I've said, you have to agree that there are men in flesh and blood bodies who will die during the millennium. And there are born-again believers from the church age walking around in glorified bodies who cannot die. And you're also going to have men of other nations who don't necessarily love the Lord, but made it into the millennium because they were good to the Jew during the trib. So this brings up a question asked by someone. The question was, where do the people go when they do die in the millennium? You would think the answer is the third heaven. And, I mean, if somebody wants to believe that, go ahead. Because, I mean, that's an easy explanation for it. That they would go to the third heaven. However, it was the church that was promised to go to the third heaven at death. Remember, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth at death, not going up to the third heaven until the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then it was, it was only promised to the church, born-again believers, that we would go to heaven at death. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So we are presently sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. In a sense, I'm already in heaven, Ephesians 2, 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And as you know, the Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth when they died and were taken up to the third heaven when Jesus Christ resurrected but what about the millennium? When a man dies in the millennium, does he go to the third heaven just like me and you would go to the third heaven if we died? I'm not so sure about that because the Lord in the millennium is going to be on the throne in Jerusalem. The saints from all the other ages are also on the earth. The body of Christ, born-again believers, are walking around on the earth. So why would a saint in the, in the millennium why would he go to the third heaven? Everybody's on the earth. A theory is that the location for the saints in the, heart, in the heart of the earth starts taking people in again. You know how men went to the heart of the earth in the Old Testament. The saints went to one side. The lost went to the other side. So a theory, it's a theory. I don't teach this as 100% fact. But the theory is that the location for the saints in the heart of the earth starts taking people in again. In Revelation 20, 12 through 13, it talks about death and hell. Now, for a long time, I just saw it as death and hell, you know, being just lost people. But the death part could be speaking of the comfort side of the heart of the earth and hell, the torment side, obviously, which... When the death side is emptied, both compartments end up in the lake of fire because there will be complete victory over both. But look at it in Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the fact that the book of life is there shows us that at the great white throne judgment, there's going to be some people there whose names are in the book of life. That would be tribulation saints, Saints from the millennium who didn't get to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ will be judged at the great white throne judgment. And it says, And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, death and hell, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, the theory is, saints who die in the millennium could go into the heart of the earth, similar to how it was in the Old Testament. They'd be resurrected at the great white throne judgment. They'll be judged there. Their names will be in the book of life because they were saints. And the wicked from all ages will be cast into the lake of fire. That is a theory, and I'm not the first to teach it. Not even close. The teaching's been around a long time, a lot longer than me and you have been alive. And I call it a theory because I just, I'm hesitant to, to just be so dogmatic on things like that's in the millennium and the eternity because, I mean, it's, it's just some deep stuff. But if you want to say the saints go to the third heaven when they die in the millennium, that's fine with me. It's certainly a lot easier to explain. And it's going to cause a lot less fights. But, you know, I, I like to just have a lot of verses for what I'm saying. And I just don't have any verses that they're going to the third heaven when they die. I just don't have any verses for that. Maybe you do. Show them to me. Because, I mean, I'm searching for truth just like you are. I don't want to be teaching something that's wrong. So we see that men die in the millennium. We know that for a fact. I mean, we could say that for a fact, that men die in the millennium. We got clear verses clearly saying that they die. We got clear verses that show us that sin is still an issue because there will be men with flesh and blood bodies. We know that for certain. We know for certain that me and you will have the glorified bodies and we won't have a problem with sin anymore. But that isn't true for the other people there. What we don't know for certain like 100% sure is where they go when they die. I just gave you my theory. And like I said, I don't teach that as an absolute 100% fact. Maybe you got something that could show an absolute, that it's an absolute fact where they go. But that brings up another question asked by someone in an email. Will men be prone to sin in the millennium? Will they be prone to rebel against the Lord? Now, I've showed you that men are definitely going to sin, men are definitely going to die, but I personally don't believe that they're going to be prone to rebel against the Lord. I believe it's going to be different than how it is now. I mean, right now, men are prone to rebel. I mean, it's the common thing for men to rebel and sin and be against God. That's the common thing. I believe it flips around and it's the opposite in the millennium. That's what I personally believe. Because I'm going to show you some deterrence to crime and also some struggles that are present today that cause men to rebel that won't be in the millennium. But the nations have to come up and see Jesus Christ or they won't get any rain for their crops. That's one deterrent. In Zechariah fourteen seventeen, it says, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. That's a deterrent to going against the Lord. Now, there will be men who come up to worship the king because they have to, not because they want to. But I personally believe it's going to be rare to find someone, at least at first, who doesn't want to be on the Lord's side. Another deterrent to crime is a literal lake of fire on earth in the millennium. When men go up to see the Lord to worship the king, they will visibly see the carcasses of men in a visible lake of fire on the earth Isaiah 66, 23 through 24. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. The people that are coming to worship the Lord and when they go by, they're going to see the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against him. These two things are going to keep people in line. The fact that they have to come to worship before the Lord or they get no rain. The fact that they're going to see people burning in a lake of fire. That's going to be a deterrent to crime. And I mean, this isn't, these are, these are good things because, 
You know, if people, if when somebody killed somebody today, if they got the death penalty and it, they really got it and didn't just be on death row or just get life in prison, you'd have a lot less murder. If there were real consequences for things, people wouldn't act the way they act. But these two things are going to keep people in line. If, if a man's prone to rebel, he's going to change real quick when he sees these things. But not only this, but the fact that the devil and unclean spirits won't be there is also another reason why I don't believe people will be prone to rebel, at least for most part of the thousand-year reign. Zechariah 13, 2, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So the unclean spirit's not going to be there to further deceive people. And then Revelation 20, 1 through 3, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled." And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, the fact that Satan is loosed again shows us that not everyone will be in glorified bodies with their eternity settled because he's going out to deceive the nations again when he is loosed. Satan isn't loosed to get another chance for himself. He is loosed so that the people in the millennium, those who aren't part of the body of Christ, will have a chance to really make a choice. And up to this point, I think the average choice was for the Lord. Up to this point, I don't think men were prone to rebel. But Revelation 27 through 10, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up to the breadth of the earth, and could pass the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that Satan is loosed, he has gathered enough people to make an army as the sand of the sea. That's a lot of people. But before this... I don't think the average man was prone to rebel. I believe the rebellion during the millennium will be more underground and behind the scenes, just like many times in this present evil world. It's the opposite. A group of Christians might have to meet behind the scenes. It's not going to be unknown to the Lord that these things are going on behind the scenes, but it will be allowed just like things are allowed today because it goes right along with the prophecies that he's got laid out in the scriptures. But I think the kingdom is going to be the best kingdom man has ever seen. It will be much better under the Lord Jesus Christ than under the reign of any man who has ever lived. He will be the one that really exposes the evil man. They thought Trump was going to do it, and maybe he tried that's beyond my knowledge, but it's the Lord that's going to expose the evil and get justice for the evil and come in with an army and take over without the possibility of being impeached. I mean, this is the most powerful being in existence, and there isn't going to be anyone to even stand against him. It's going to be unlike any of us have ever seen when they see his power, his perfect way of ruling, and when they see the deterrence to crime, and when the unclean spirits and the devil are locked away. I believe men, for the most part, will be prone to serve the Lord with some rebellion in an underground setting. And then you have the end where Satan leads a good portion astray. Now the question, the next question is about after the millennium. Where do the different classes of people go in eternity? Well, I believe in eternity, the church gets New Jerusalem. Galatians 4.26 But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. I believe our homeland will be New Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. A lot of Christians think we're just going to spend eternity in heaven. And they don't start thinking about, you know, where are they, is, get specific with it and think about where am I going to spend eternity. They don't realize heaven comes down. I believe the Jews will get the new earth because as God promised to Abraham, it is an everlasting covenant. 
Remember those verses we talked about earlier in, in Isaiah 66 that showed a future new heaven and a new earth. In Isaiah 66, 22, it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. The seed and name that remain, that's, that's Israel. God doesn't forget his promise to Abraham, and his seed will continue to get bigger as they populate the new earth and possess their land without threat of an enemy taking over. Then the Gentiles, I believe, will get the new heavens. In Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. I believe it goes back to how it should have been if Adam and Eve never sinned. They will populate God's creation, and his increase will see no end. Those in flesh and blood bodies will eat off the tree of life to live forever. Unlike us, me and you as born-again believers, in eternity we won't have to eat off of a tree because we'll already have eternal life. We'll already be in, a, in glorified bodies. We don't have to eat off of a tree. Another question came up was, will all born-again believers that get glorified bodies, will we all have the same exact body? This is what I believe. Look at 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty nine through 41. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So just like the Lord made stars unique, he made his angels unique. For example, Gabriel and Michael, other, other heavenly beings like the cherubim and seraphim are also different. I believe the saints who make up the church will have a body like the Lord, but it will be unique as one star differeth from another star in glory. And 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I don't know what it's going to be like completely, but we know we're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord has such power that he made every man's hands unique. Job 37, 7 says, He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. You see, none of us got the same fingerprints, and it's the Lord that sealed up the hand of every man. It makes sense that he would make us unique in our glorified bodies if we're so unique right now. Imagine walking through the millennial kingdom and seeing millions of glorified saints, all unique, all with a different name, all with a purpose, all holy, harmless, undefiled, not sinners anymore. Not in the fleshy bodies that sin. Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorified, glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You possibly, you're, you're probably going to have a new name, as it talks about in Revelation 2.17. It says, And in, a, in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. I did a video a while back about the Fortnite video game, against the Fortnite video game. Supposedly, kids are getting their parents' credit cards and buying these different skins, which is basically different characters or clothes that they put on. If these video games can have all these characters and different skins that are unique, I don't think everyone in God's kingdom is going to look alike. I mean, all of these video games and cartoons... They've all got these different looking characters. The comic books all have these different looking characters and their counterfeit glorified bodies. I believe the Lord's going to have our glorified bodies be unique personally. Did you know that even the snowflakes are unique? And do you know who makes the snow fall? In Job 37, 6, For he saith to the snow, Be thou on the earth. So if God makes our hands unique he makes us unique he makes each snowflake unique and as we talked about you know the angels discussed in the bible are unique with different names they're called the sons of god in the old testament and as you know angels have chosen 
to fall in the past, and they will again in the future. We are sons of God, and we, as born-again believers, replace all those unique angels that fell. We will be much more powerful, and we have something special that the angels don't have, and that's a soul. We'll be superior to the angels in that we will judge angels. In 1 Corinthians 6, 3, Know you not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life. If God makes men unique today, I think we will be unique in eternity. And I, that's just what I believe. I can't say that 100%, but that's what I believe. You know, a lot of the things I've said, you know, you may not agree with it 100%. You may not agree with a lot of it. But I mean, do you have a better answer to these questions? I mean, what would you, how would you answer these questions? You know, you don't hear any of this talked about ever by anybody. And that's why there's so many questions on the millennium and eternity. People are interested in these things and they just don't hear about it. But it's just, it's one, a lot of it is one of them things you sit and talk about, you know, on a rainy day with other believers that aren't going to get mad at you for what you say. You know, it's silly to get mad at me for things I've said in this. I've not said anything that's that's damnable heresy or something. <clears throat> so I hope that, that you'll res respect my views on it, and I'll respect your views on it. And, you know, if you don't agree, that's fine. If you agree, great. You know, we don't know everything about what's going to happen in eternity. We don't know exactly what our glorified bodies are going to look like. But it is fun to sit around and think about eternity. We're keeping our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And I appreciate the people that ask these questions because that shows that they're actually studying the Bible. Or they wouldn't have questions like this because most people don't even know what the millennium is anyway. Most Christians don't know what the millennium is. But that's the answers to these questions.